Nikolai Salad as much as the next guy. Unless the next guy is named Mr. Giant Bunny. David. Last night. And the show was so much fun and just so good. It was, it was white hot. And uh, <laughs> as a result, we didn't really can hear my, uh, a voice in my head saying, Dave, you're just full of hot gas. And Now, what was that? Speaking, <laughs> speaking of hot gas, well... Uh, also, and the NBC Orchestra right over there. Jerry Lewis really, uh, did you see any of the telethon this no, year? No, Paul, I was out of the country. That's right. You were in Italy. That's right. Buena sera, said Gilino. <laughs> he raised a lot of money, and I got to thinking, you know, I remember the, uh, towards the end of the day, on the second day, when he and, and Tony Orlando were split screen, New York, Las Vegas, right. you know? And how well they worked together. And I started to think to myself, you and I are just as close as, as Tony Orlando, and Jerry Lewis, and yet we, well, yet we look so far apart, we're almost like a coast, continents apart, just like, just like they are. So I was wondering if, I spoke to Hal about this earlier, if we could get a kind of a, a, a split screen <laughs> thing between us and, and bring, and... We seem to, we seem to have lost New York here. Just to... <laughs> oh, look at that, Dave. they're even labeled. That's very nice. Dave, let me, let me say one thing. Yes, Paul. The love we're feeling over here. <laughs> are you feeling the same thing yes, over there? Yes, we are, Paul. We're feeling an incredible amount of love over here. And, and let me I'm, just say, buena sera, sorry, said Jolino. Yeah, can't we're getting hear. some kind of an echo here in New York, yeah. Paul. Uh, what are we doing here? All right, let's do that. Uh, it's time to go into the control room to see what Hal Gurney is wearing, our beloved director. Take it away, Hal. Okay. Hal Gurney. Hi, Hal. Nice to see you. Hi, what, are you what are you wearing tonight, Hal? Well, Dave, it's the blue shirt. Can you see this? And the uh, uh -huh. chinos. Very nice. The, uh, the brown loafers. Brown loafers. By the way, Dave, uh, this will be the last time I'll be doing this. Now, uh, why is that, Hal? Well, I, I'd like to, you know, I, everybody's sick of this. Uh, they're just fed up with it. And I want to pursue some other interests. You know, I've been neglecting certain things. I'll uh -huh. get back to that. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, well, Hal, let me just say that from the bottom of my heart, we have certainly enjoyed hearing from you each night well, to find out what you're wearing. I've enjoyed it, Dave. Thank you. And, and I, know it's, I know it's not much, Hal, but we would like, to, uh, like you to have this bouquet of lovely flowers. Jocelyn? Oh, that's nice. There you are, Hal. Oh. We'd also like you to have this beautiful cake. There it is. Congratulations. Oh, look at and that. I certainly hope you can get a lot of use out of these golf clubs, Al. This hey. lovely set of golf clubs. I wish I played, Dave. I and who knows, maybe yeah. you'll yeah. find a place right. in your den for this lovely plaque. So there you are, oh, Al. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a joy. Look at that, Dave. What Al's oh, wearing. Man. 1987, 1987. Dave, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to, uh, I want to test out the, uh, the uh, fountain device here. The fountain device, the pipe-like object. No, it's not. It's something uh, we were calling it the prancing fluids. I know, I know. No longer, are you saying we can no longer call uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, Paul, apparently you're having trouble hearing us out there in Las Vegas, but... Yeah. I'm, There's I'm an just, audio problem somewhere down the line. I'm just saying that we call them the prancing fluids, and they're there. What's next here? Top 10. Category tonight in the top 10 uh, list uh, from the home office in Scottsdale, Arizona. Top, name, uh, top 10 names for Robert Bork's beard. <laughs> he, has a, he has a little beard. If you were to go into a barber shop and request a Bork-like beard, you could use any one of these names and they would know instantly what you were talking about. Number 10. 
the chin slinky, number nine. The Amish outlaw, number eight, the see-through. Number seven, my very first beard from Kenner. Number six, the lunatic fringe. Number five, Senor Itchy. Number four, the radioactive goat. Number three, salute to see Everett Coop. Number two, gopher butt. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the number one name, the babe magnet. We cut, somebody cut the cord, sabotage, was it sabotage? We had a, a wonderful thing. We had a, a whole lovely tableau uh, prepared and ready to go. And then, the, now what's going on? Are these people with the network, these people running around here like some kind of an emergency? Well, I tell you what, we'll try. What we had planned was so exciting and so special and the kind of thing you won't see anywhere else in this country on TV at any rate. We'll load it up and try it again later. later. Buonasera, Sedulino. Thank you. So we'll go on. We have so many wonderful things planned tonight. It, the list just gets longer and longer every night. Can you hear me out there in Las Vegas, Paul? We're having a little... Uh, you look good. Uh, I want to tell you what you're doing. All right, Thank you. We, uh, we have for you here a little quiz. You can take this at home. Uh, if you want to get the kids out of bed so they can play along, uh, that's a good idea as well. It's our back-to-school quiz. Paul, do you have yeah. music for our back-to-school quiz? The musicians quiz? here uh, in Vegas don't know. It's not my usual uh, orchestra yeah. out here in Vegas. So you don't, don't, you don't have music for don't. No, I do. I do. Let's see. Uh, yeah, chicks. Cats. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that's school. Oh, 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 I go to swing school. Here's our first question. This year's most popular campus job is A, clerking in the bookstore, B, working at the student union grill, C, selling a clean urine to the football team. <laughs> Number two, the motto of New York University is A, light and truth, B, for the good of all, C, give me a quarter. Number three, a successful school science program demands A, dedicated teachers, B, high budget outlays for lab equipment, C, lots of smart Asian kids. <laughs> How many did I throw away there? Two or three? Is this number four? Yeah. At most universities, a tenured philosophy professor earns less than A, a sanitation man, B, a lawyer, C, a starter on the varsity basketball team. Uh, number five, from uh, Room 222 to Fame, TV shows have delivered the message that high school students are A, at a uniquely vulnerable stage, B, trying hard to live right, C, in their late 20s. <laughs> uh, number six, any student caught copying somebody else's work a, should fail the class. I wonder if uh, Senator Biden is listening to this. A, should fail the class. B, should be suspended from school. C, well, I've blown the joke. Number, number seven. <laughs> As the Bork hearings continue, returning law school students are debating the question, is he fit to sit upon the highest bench in the land? B, what exactly is his judicial philosophy? C, isn't he the guy who played King Tut on Batman? Uh, number eight, many students are especially looking forward to returning to school this year because A, it's been a long summer. B, they're looking forward to seeing their friends again. C, Geraldo Rivera is now on five days a week. Okay, number nine, how are we doing on time? It's working out perfectly then, isn't it? Yeah. 
Uh, number nine, the biggest story on campus newspapers uh, this week will undoubtedly be A, the Bork hearings, B, the Pope's visit, C, Spuds McKenzie's neutering. Huh? I'm sorry. I had a little cramp muscle here. A little muscle cramp. Uh, okay, here we go. We get a great show. Rob Dave, Dave Clark Five, isn't it? Dave Clark Five. Bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. Sure. Are we ready with the thrill cam again? Okay, we're going to pick it up from where we left off. As you recall, it was just that static shot of nothingness. Here once again, ladies and gentlemen, the thrill cam, the miracle of the decade, technologically speaking. Take it away, boys. Two, three. <laughs> So they apparently, they apparently got the bugs out of it and, uh, I don't know, we got trouble there, huh? Yeah, so we won't see it tonight, I'm sorry. It's, it's not my fault, ladies and gentlemen, you understand, it's the fault of this damn network. So please spare me your hostilities. I'm on your side, I understand, I'm as disappointed as you people are. Nobody wanted to see that any more than yours truly, all right? Uh, all right, let's just get on. We have such a great show, we can sustain a loss like that. Uh, our first guest tonight is a, a talented actor and director, and uh, his first film was This Is Final Tap. Last summer, he directed Stand By Me, and his latest film, The Princess Bride, opens this week. Please say hello to Rob Reiner. <laughs> Rob, good to see you. Thank you so much. You know, it's rough following a faulty thrill cam. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's difficult. Do I remind, I just looked at myself backstage as I came out, do I remind you, of the, remember that guy John Nagy learned to draw? Yeah, I do, yeah. I mean, with the beard in this thing, yeah. I look like that guy. He went, uh, it was uh, like a weekend, like a Saturday or Sunday yeah, morning Yeah, Saturday, show. Sunday morning, and this guy would come out with a yeah. beard, a dress with a shirt like yeah. this, and would paint, uh, you know, the lumberjack yeah. or something like that, like on a matchbook cover. Show you very quickly how to draw how to something. draw something, and of course you know you know you drew on the television set and uh, ruined it. Your parents got mad. But it was you know it was a it was a fascinating show. Now that you bring it up, I mean it was the kind of thing where you just I don't think it was that fascinating. Well, Dave. Well, you're talking about a oh, six-year-old okay. kid. Yes. Oh, you know. for a six-year-old kid, it was. Yeah. yeah, to see something come to life. You didn't think it was that fascinating, yet you dress like the guy. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to trade in on him, you know, bring him back to life. You know, I think uh, uh, I guess you've been here three or four times, and yes. I, what I think is great here is that. Uh, First of all, you were on one of the most successful situation comedies ever in the history of television and will forever be considered that. And that would be great. That yes, would just that would be, be great. That would be plenty yeah. enough for anybody. Yeah. Even and if I won the Nobel Prize, would say Meathead wins Nobel. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it is. It's a legacy. It's yeah. a legacy that you don't want to but, dismiss. But now what you're doing is you've become one of the best filmmakers working today. Oh, I well, think that's a great you. thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. that. Sure. You know, not many people know that this is a, a policy that's just come into being here at, uh, I guess it's NBC. I don't know if it's... I don't know if it, it was. Either. They now, and I'll tell the, the, to the world and the rest of the audience, that they make you... And this, I think, just happened this week. They make you sign uh, a piece of paper that uh, 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 testifies to the fact that you're an American citizen. You have to, in order to get on the David Letterman show, and this is true, you have to bring proof of American citizenship, right. which uh, means a passport, a driver's license, and a birth certificate. Right. This is all true. I'm not making this up. And I thought, this is very odd. I mean, what are they trying to prevent? Illegal <laughs> aliens? I mean, that's the first thing an illegal alien thinks of when he comes to this country. I got to get on a talk show. I just got to do it. You know, if I can just get on some talk show, oh, you know, what are they preventing here? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I, I don't understand it. It yeah. is a it's it a, is a law. It's rule, a true. It's a from the law. immigration department. Yeah, it's strange. Yeah. And I don't fully understand it. Yeah. But every well, I was born and raised in New York, so it helps. Uh, Speaking of people coming from other countries, you spent yeah. a, a large I, amount of your time. In I the... did making the Princess Bride, which is which is coming out, uh, I guess, in a week uh, in New York, week or so in New York, and then in uh, about two, three weeks around the rest of the country. Uh, we shot in England, and uh, it was a great experience for me because I got to go and live in a country 
for six months and you know as you go as a tourist to different places you don't really get the feel mm -hmm. of what it's like to live in in a place and and to really sense the people and all that and that part was really good for me and we shot a lot of the film uh, in the northern part of England about three hours north of London in an area called Derbyshire and there are these beautiful the reason we shot there's these beautiful old castles and we needed that for the film and you know when you visit you go on a, as a tourist to these places you look at a castle and it's uh, you, you don't really connect it with people living there yeah, I mean it's, it's just, just like you know, you don't imagine anybody yeah. actually lived there. I mean, you look at them in documentaries, and you say, well, it's a beautiful old castle, and it was built in such and such year, and you don't really... But working there and spending every day there, I really got the sense of what it was like to live in a place like this. The first place we, we shot was a place called Haddon Hall, which was built in 1086, and was built by William the Conqueror for his illegitimate son. Yeah. I mean, I wonder what his real son got him. I mean, a much better place <laughs> than this castle. But I'm walking around, and I had one of the oddest experiences, because, again, like I say, you get a sense that there were really people living in this place, you know, 900 years ago. And you know how you are. You just wander around, and tunes start, you know, come to your head, and you start humming a tune. And my friend Billy Crystal, who's, uh, you know, a very, very close friend, does a great Sammy Davis Jr., as we know. You know, he does a wonderful <laughs> imitation of Sammy. And he does an imitation of Sammy singing uh, the theme from Candid Camera. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's great. My friend Christopher Guest, who is also in the movie, Billy, by the way, is in Princess Bride. Christopher Guest, who was in Spinal Tap, is also in Princess Bride. He does an imitation of Billy doing an imitation of Sammy singing the theme. And I do an imitation of Chris doing Billy doing Sammy singing the theme. And I, one day, you know, while waiting for the camera to be set up, I'm, I'm walking around and I'm singing, Where the hocus pocus, <laughs> you're in focus. <laughs> it's your lucky day. Smile, you're on ten. And I'm singing this, and it occurs to me. First of all, it's the worst Sammy Davis Jr. ever done by anybody. But it occurs to me. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I appreciate it. Paul's in Las Vegas yes. tonight. You know. I know. I know. Yeah. It's, it's, how is it there? It's, it's not the heat. It's the it's the stupidity. I, I know. <laughs> but it occurred to me how odd that, I mean, 900 years ago, when William the Conqueror's illegitimate son was roaming around that castle, did he ever in his wildest imagination think that some filmmaker would be doing an imitation of somebody singing yeah. the Candid Camera theme? Yeah. I mean, it's totally bizarre and surreal. And, and then I found myself at Penshurst Castle, which is another place we shot, where Henry VIII lived and when he courted Anne Boleyn uh, at a place called Hever, which we also shot. And I was singing... Uh, What's your name? Is it Mary or Sue? And I was harmonizing with Chris Guest and Mandy Patinkin, who are beautiful singers. And I'm thinking, you know, this, this is the same place that this man ate and thought about chopping his wife's head off. And there's a guy singing the song in the same room. I mean, it's just totally singing odd. Singing oldies there. Oldies, oldies, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, really. You know, although what all these were sung back then. Yeah, know? but you know that's that's just part of life. I'm yeah, sure that I guess that, so. that level of activity took place then yeah, too. I guess so. Did yeah. Yeah, I guess so? And uh, what will they think 900 years from now? Is there a film? Are we stopping now? I don't know. I'm getting something. Are we, something here. Are we getting something? All right, we have to do a commercial. We'll do a we'll commercial. We'll come back. We'll, we'll talk right about other yeah, stuff. We got other things to okay. talk about. We'll be right back. Moment at the at the end of uh, of uh, Stand by Me, when this lovely story, interesting story, kind of a universal theme mm. uh, is finishing up and uh, and the, the theme to the movie comes up it was a real nice yeah. piece of work and and it's funny I mean Benny King uh, who you know wrote and recorded stand by me had like a, a, a whole new lease on life because of the film. oh yeah I yeah. mean he's gotten you know concert yeah. bookings and all that stuff right. it's wonderful. And I think he was here uh, subsequently uh, after the film's release and, yeah. and sang it on this show yeah, it was yeah, real nice. that's beautiful but now that wasn't uh, where did the, that name come from that triggered off every well, I had always planned, uh, the, the initial name of the film was called The Body. Right. It was based on a Stephen, Stephen King, King short story, right. And I had always planned to use Stand By Me over the closing credits because I just, I love that song. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, one of, it's a classic all-time rock and roll song. So I was always planning to use that. And people felt, uh, the marketing people at Columbia and everybody, and myself included, felt that the, the title, The Body, with a Stephen King from a novella from Stephen King, people might get the wrong sure. impression that it was a horror movie or something like that. So 
we were racking our brains to try to think of some kind of title come up and I said well we're using yeah. Stand By Me as the closing song why don't we just call it that yeah. nobody was really all that thrilled about that title but they, it was like the lesser of evil said okay we'll yeah. go with that and it's one of those things yeah. that uh, yeah. the, the thought process that, that caused that to happen didn't really follow any logical sequence but no. when it comes no, together but, it but then when you, but then when you think yeah. about it it does work it that makes sense yeah. for the film yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, t tell me about the time um, and maybe I don't have all of the yeah. facts here. I'll try. You were you, you played a lot of hippies before you got the role. Oh along God! There. Yes. And uh, yes, I did. I was I was the resident Hollywood hippie yeah. in we're, in uh, Gomer Pyle shows, Beverly Hillbillies, uh, That Girl, all the, the, these early shows. Yeah. And, you know, and making a real statement, uh, <laughs> you know, an opportunity yeah. on these shows to really uh, get forth really say and, something. Yeah, bring sure. these ideas across. Uh, and there was one, and I don't even know the show. Maybe it, maybe the show never got on the air. Maybe it was a pilot or something yeah. that was pretty by uh, Desi Arnaz or he was oh oh yes yes I was on the uh, show called the mothers-in-law that la was last it lasted about a season or two yeah. seasons and I got into a big fight with Desi yes uh -huh. that was a that was a big scandal out there and we got into this big screaming match because I, I was an improvisational actor and I used to ad-lib a lot and this was during a rehearsal it wasn't even during the uh, the, uh, the the shooting and during rehearsal I, I improvised something and and Desi got really mad at me. I mean, he was steaming, you know. I mean, a Cuban steam was coming out of his ears. <laughs> Cuban steam? Yes, which I don't, I don't know if it's any different than any other kind of steam. But he was mad at me. He was high, and he says, you don't improvise on this show. No, no, don't do this. You don't improvise. We, maybe you'll do that where you come from on the committee. And, you know, because I was in improvisational theater. Well, we don't do that here, buddy. And, that, and you know, I was screaming at me. So I said, listen, maybe I should just leave. I only had five lines on the mm -hmm. show. I said, maybe I should just leave. You'll get somebody else. You'll, you know, it'll be better. He says, no, no, amigo, amigo, <laughs> no, no, don't do it. No. But I said, no, listen, Desi, I think it's better. And so the next day on the Rona Barrett show, it said, uh, uh, Rob Reiner, uh, uh, hippie psychic, bearded hip, a uh, hippie psychedelic son of actor Carl Reiner, <laughs> got into a fight with Desi Arnaz on the mothers-in-law set, and whoops, the bearded bad boy walked off the yeah. set. That was the that was the story. It's no great story. And, and I do a terrible Desi Arnaz too. No, it was good. Did, yeah. did you ever bury the hatchet with the guy, or was it that big a deal? Ah, uh, we no, we made up eventually. That's Speaking good. of bad imitations, are we breaking away? We got to go here. We got to go. We, we can't do show. We can't do bad imitations. Uh, but come back seriously. Come back. Yes, come back and bring your friend. Well, Billy, Billy Crystal's coming on the yeah, show Billy, next week. Yeah, Billy, of course, but bring your nice, normal, well-adjusted friend, Albert Oh, Brooks. Albert, Albert, yeah. <laughs> we'd, well, we'd, we'd like yeah. to have Albert here. I know you'd love to have Albert. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the uh, the Princess Bride, and uh, I have not seen it yet myself, no, but you the, will like it, everybody David, is telling me that it just turned out terrifically. Uh, it opens this week and then all over September the September 25th yeah. in New York and L.A. and October 9th around the rest of the country. Congratulations on everything. Uh, <laughs> that'll be tomorrow night. Now, let's uh, just bring out Glendora, shall we? Okay. Uh, my next guest believes in using television to spread her own special brand of happiness. She has made over 100 commercials. We have an example of one right Hi, here. Hi, folks. How are you today? Just miserable, right? This is Glendora for delicious Worthington Vegilinks. Vegilinks by Worthington, folks, have no cholesterol. Delicious Vegilinks have fewer calories than regular hot dogs, and Vegilinks have no preservatives. I have no preservatives either. You see the wrinkles? Get your delicious Vegilinks at the Glendora House Nook at... No need to shop everywhere. Go straight to Twin Fair. <laughs> and, um, and her show, A Chat with Glendora, has featured guests like Robert C. Wright, the president of NBC. Folks, please welcome the happiness lady, Glendora. Hi, Glendora. How are you? Pleasure to see you. Please, please have a seat. Where are you from, Glendora? Where does this show take place? Where can people see this? Oh, the chat with Glendora? Yeah. You can see this on Manhattan Cable TV and Paragon Cable TV, and mm -hmm. you can also see it in uh, Westchester, where all the rich people live, uh -huh. United Artists Cable. And, and from where does it originate? Uh, well, of course, we originated at Mr. Wright's office and at Madeline Smithberg's dressing room and at uh, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> and the chairman of, of General Foods and the chairman of Nestle's. We originated in people's offices. Uh -huh. Some people come to our home, David. I see. Uh, the chairman of Colgate Palmolive P came to our home. How do you get all of these people? At 7 a.m. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> and I guess you were steamed, huh, that he was there so early? Well, the thing that interested me about him, David, was that he went to, he did his own marketing research and he went through all of our cupboards to see if we had any Colgate Palmolive products. Mm -hmm. And what, what did the uh, research turn up? Zero. Zero. He, he did a... 
He didn't look under the sink cover where he would have found something. He didn't go into the bathroom cupboard. He really would have found something. Now, tell me about the show. What is the format? When somebody tunes in, what do they see? Uh, they see uh, where were you born, where did you go to school, what were your jobs, uh, what is your present work like, mm -hmm. and what advice would you give a youngster to get started on such a career today? So it's an, an interview show primarily. Yes, that's what we uh, asked Mr. Wright. Yeah, a half hour show, is it? Yes, isn't it amazing what the public will stand? Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and, and is it on once a week? Yeah, oh yes. And how many years have you been on the air? Well, I've been on television 35 years, but that show's been on the air a year and three quarters. Mm -hmm. are, are you hoping that this particular show will, will maybe grow, perhaps expand, maybe get to uh, a network status or a local TV station or something? Well, I sort of doubt that. You don't think that'll happen? No. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, well, you sure have the wardrobe for it, you know? Uh, <laughs> Now let's take a look. Show me some of the, uh, the footage. This is Robert Wright, the president oh, now Lord, yeah. of NBC. You know, how did you get this guy to be on the show? Because we've asked him for years and years. Have you? Now. Oh, yeah, and he won't, he won't uh, come on the show. How did you get him? It must be my good looks, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Except I did talk to him over the phone, so that wouldn't have helped. Uh -huh. No, I figure this way, David. He's a nice man, and he does want to help the youth. And that's what this is all he about. He wants to help the youth. Yes, that's what this problem... Uh, have, we, this have we heard anything about that? He wants to help the youth? <laughs> Paul, did you hear anything about Robert Wright wanting to help the youth of this country? Robert C. Wright? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he wants to help the youth. I, I think he just... <laughs> I, I think he's just looking to balloon the stock prices. I think that's about all we're into here. No, he's a very nice a very man. Very nice man. All right, now let's take a look at a couple of seconds from his interview on uh, your show, okay? okay is it, we have that here? Yeah. Robert uh, C. Wright and Glendora. Helping the youth. <laughs> it is a chat with Glendor. And then I, then we got uh, General Electric acquired RCA, and then I came over from General Electric to become the president of NBC, and that's how I got here. Oh, it's such an interesting career, and that's how you ended up in Fairfield because I think uh, General Electric's table was centered in Fairfield, wasn't it? Yes, I actually never worked in Fairfield. Oh, you never did? No, no, I've worked. Uh, most recently, my office was in Stamford, Connecticut, before I came here. Oh. Although I live in I live in that area, but I, I didn't work there. I see, yeah. This is Mr. Robert C. Wright, who is the president and chief executive officer of NBC. And he'll be back in just a second and tell you what his work is like to see if you'd like to aim for that as a career. And then he'll also give you some ideas how to get started in broadcasting in today's world. It, it, it seems like you and he were dressed alike. <laughs> didn't, didn't you? So you sort of have the same, same kind of look there. Now, uh, I don't want to linger on this, but how did General, Electric, uh, General Electric's acquisition of RCA, how, how did that ultimately help the youth of this country? It, <laughs> what helped the youth was Mr. Wright telling how he got started because I see. he was, at the, same point, yeah, he was yeah. at the same point in his development as the youth who watched the program we hope are in there. I see. Uh, now tell me about your, your personal recipe for happiness. You're, you're known oh, as the, yeah, the happiness yeah, yeah. lady, well, is I'll that what you. they say? No. <laughs> what do they call you? Glendora. Yeah. <laughs> And, and what did you say your name was? I'm Dave. I'll be the, now, my last night. <laughs> you are a very good interviewer. Well, thank you. And I'm going to recommend you for a raise. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, the recipe for happiness, David, is that there's one thing in this world that you can do better than anybody else. And if you will go by yourself, you will find out what that is. And you will do it, and you'll be happy. Now, if you don't do it, David, it's going to nag at you every second of your mm -hmm. life. So you find out what it is that you're good at. No, the one thing that you can do better than anybody else. The one thing you can do better than anyone else, yeah. and you just concentrate on that. Yes, you do. And then that'll make you happy. Well, sure, because you'll get everything you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the Vegilinks, uh, <laughs> vegetable protein, no, no meat at all in here, right? No, no meat. No? All right. Uh, well, geez, Glendora, good luck with the show. Oh, thank you very yeah, much. And uh, I hope you can uh, come back and see us again sometime. Oh, we'd like to very much. Uh, is that, would that take two days or just one the next time? I, I don't know. I don't know. What, oh, that's right. You were supposed to be here last night. Okay. We, uh, we have to go here now. We have other guests. But thank you very much. Nice Appearance on our